All right, so um, I'm going to go to a case um, that, uh, you know, sometimes you have to present things that we don't want to present. So no judgment zone, Malik. No judgment zone. Okay, so, so this is a, I, I have obviously no relevant financial disclosures with this case. But uh, <clears throat> so 74-year-old female, uh, hypertension, non-insulin dependent diabetes, a hyperlipidemia, ex-smoker, uh, who presented to our clinic with two prior PCIs, but also had been, was, was called actually by um, um, his PCP to letting us know that, that she's had recurrent TIA. She went to an ophthalmologist and uh, it was diagnosed uh, that she had transient monocular uh, left eye vision loss. Um, and she was, so she was referred to us. So initially we, we put her on medications, uh, Peter and I, and we watched her, but she had a recurrent attack. So at that time we felt that, okay, she's failing, um, you know, max, maximum medical therapy. And we said, let's go ahead and, uh, and then fix this. So medication wise, she had lisinopril, metformin and all the good medicine and the pertinent labs weren't really relevant to this case. So she, we sent her to our lab and uh, Jeff or Daniela did this um, uh, ultrasound that showed um, in the internal carotid, carotid velocities of uh, 516 and the EDV of uh, 262 with uh, consistent with significant uh, high grade carotid artery stenosis. So we decided to go ahead with that ultrasound, bring her uh, to the lab. And at that stage, uh, Peter and I really don't uh, uh, perform um, left, ra I mean, right radial carotid interventions, but because of her, her, um, her high grade arch in terms of having the bovine arch, uh, we felt that, okay, at this stage, uh, this is probably good for us to avoid any unnecessary manipulation uh, of her, um, of her um, uh, arch in order to be able to go ahead and get in. So we just took this initial shot and then, whoops, and then, and then we're able to advance the sheet up o over this, and then we took the initial diagnostic angiogram. And as you can see here, uh, what's happening here? Yep. Oh yeah, so we have, that, we have the wire up, and let me just cut to the chase, okay. So we get the sheet up with the wire in the external, we get the sheet up, and we take a picture, and this is what we see. So we have a high grade stenosis and obviously something going on distal to the, uh, the uh, I should say proximal now, I guess to the uh, uh, sheath right there, we see something going on, but we said, okay, well, we're gonna have to deal with that. Let's go ahead and, um, and do what we have to do. Uh, place a filter across, obviously take a brain shot showing competitive flow. Obviously we had diagnostics on the other side, but showed no significant stenosis. And we, we went ahead and you can see something proximal is getting a little bit worse. But we said, okay, let's uh, continue what we're doing. And we, put, we went ahead, put our filter up, and did our transfemoral carotid standing together with a nice result. But again, you can see there's a nice uh, filling defect or whatever is going on distally. At that stage, uh, we surmised that we had dissected the, uh, the, the proximal internal carotid while we uh, transited the sheath across the radial. And Ravish, maybe you can comment on some techniques on that as it was a kind of an acute uh, takeoff. So then we said, okay, let's maintain position and let's try to place another stent. So you can see here you have dye staining. Patient is quite stable at this time. So we said to ourselves, uh, let's place the stent. And here's another self-expanding stent going in. And as we place the stent, you can see that there's still a little proximal lesion there causing no flow. So we went ahead again and placed another stent. And as we did that, we lost everything. So everything fell out of the carotid and uh, including our sheath with the, except, with the exception of our wire up north. And at this stage, uh, we, we decided to sit down and say, okay, well, what are we gonna do? So we said, well, let's take a picture and see what's happening. So of course we took the picture and we have no flow in the carotid now. So we have no flow in the carotid with the, with the wire up and we say to ourselves, well, now we're, we're a little bit of a soup here. So what are we gonna do? So we tried to manipulate the sheath on this wire as gentle as we could. And unfortunately we could not get up the carotid. So at this stage, we decided to get, forgive me. Uh, yeah, oh yeah, we put an 035 wire up into the, into, into the carotid through the lesion and we could, we're, not, we're unable to track the sheath. Excuse me, I think that, that might have been the wrong picture. But anyway, we tried multiple things. So at this stage, we decided to go transfemoral, got transfemoral access, and again with the VTEC catheter, we're able to slowly, gets better, believe me. We're, we're able to slowly get a, um, 
what is it called? 018 wire, right, Pete? It was an 018 wire. I think it was the, it was some 018 wire up. And then we checked our position in the, in the internal carotid siphon, found that we were intraluminal still, great. So we said, let's go ahead and stent. So as we were stenting, you can see there's still no flow here. We have our sheath up, everything looks good, but we wanted to make sure that we covered the ostium of the left internal carotid artery. So then, this is, a, I'll take this one on me. Um, I said, oh, let's inject from the arm and see what happens. So as we inject from the arm, we dissect the innominate. Now we have no flow in the internal carotid artery on the, on the, on the left and probably a little bit of flow on the right. So any comments, any thoughts other than change your underwear? I mean, <laughs> well, we, we have the surgeon with us. <laughs> I gotta go home. <laughs> I mean, right now you gotta understand, Peter's like punching me in the arm, he's like kicking me under the table. So, Pete, I mean, it's not fun. So, what would, I mean, what would you guys do now? We said we got no flow in both. So, we have this tent in place, as you can see on the other side. And while we inject here, we, we dissect this carotid. And now she's becoming a little symptomatic, as you can see by her movement. Well, we have action from both sides, but we have a dissection platinum in the nominate tracking up the right, but we have the stent in place on the right, so we said let's secure the right, I mean the left, excuse me. Let's secure the left and then decide. So, so with, with some quick decision making, we went ahead, stent to the left, and there is flow, as you can see. We were, at this stage, we weren't really concerned about that because we knew we had good flow on the left, and when we injected, you can see it's a very complex dissection plane entering in from the, um, from the nominate into the a right internal carotid artery. So now the decision became, well, you know, now we have to again tread our one four, our four wire up the right internal carotid artery and check our position. Again, with great, uh, at, at this stage, once we stented the left, she became asymptomatic again. And then we went ahead and were able to check our position. As you can see, you have good flow there at this stage. And then we were able to tread a, tread a wire up and just showing you the brain shots here. We were able to tread a wire up into the right internal carotid artery with a great deal of caution, okay? And then you can see here with further injection, this is still in the left, I'm still showing you the left, but you can see now you're starting to get a flow in the right. So we left a pigtail in what we thought was the true lumen because we advanced the pigtail down into the aorta and then used that pigtail as a guide uh, for us to be able to tread a wire into the, the, uh, the right internal carotid artery. Right there. So then, once we do this here, here's the dye staining as you can see. Here's our wire going up into, in, into the, what, we, what we thought was the true lumen. And then we obviously checked our position, uh, which, which showed that we were true luminal above. And then we took a, a, a stent and we placed it in the, in the, in the, in the common carotid artery on the, on the right side. So this is standing the common carotid artery, but still there's very little flow. Internal carotid artery was spared, thank God. So at this stage, we wanted to tack up the proximal part of the, of the dissection. So, uh, so there was a lot of discussion between me and Peter on whether we should stand the innominate into the, uh, into the internal and jail off the subclavian, but we felt the overlapping of stents across the ostium of the left uh, uh, common carotid artery might create a problem. So we decided to just stent the ostium very carefully. And you can see here, uh, when this is a bad picture, yeah. You can see here as the stent goes up there. And here we're checking our position just to make sure that we hit the ostium. And then we stent it across the ostium right there. And now we have reasonable flow of both carotids and the patient was totally asymptomatic. So at this stage, again, we checked the position and everything looked good. Uh, we kept her on the floor for two days. Uh, she had no neurologic event. Uh, she did not have a stroke. And this is what, over three years ago now, Pete, I think, right? And it's uh, February 22. I just saw her uh, about six months ago. And as she's patent without any stenosis, we've maintained her on, um, on um, dual antiplatelet therapy throughout. So she's been on dual, we have not stopped the dual antiplatelet therapy. We continue to see her uh, every three months uh, in clinic, just clinically, uh, and get ultrasound surveillance. So just uh, some teaching points, Ravish. I know you've done probably the most uh, radial carotid stents out of anyone in this room, so. Uh, that, that was uh, phenomenal. The 
the, the way you pulled yourselves out of that. Uh, so yeah, I think you're right. It was the, the sharp angle, uh, right? So some bovines, you have a sharp lateral, uh, which makes it really hard from the transfermal, but really easy from the radial. This one was kind of a hybrid almost, uh, where you've got a sharp takeoff uh, from the radial approach. What kind of sheath did you use? You we used, Raman was a radial sheath, right? Uh, Tarumo. R2P. It's the R2P. So we've done a bunch of these, uh, and I do think for a left carotid uh, stenosis using in a bovine conf arch configuration, it's nice to come from the right radial. It, it usually shoots you right into the, the ostium of the, of the left common carotid artery. But uh, we used a different sheath. We, we said, oh, you know, it'll be even, you know, uh, smaller caliber going in, less likelihood of, of an injury to the, the radial artery and what have you. But I think it doesn't have the same level of support. I know it's hydrophilic, but we typically have used a shuttle sheath in that in that configuration. So I don't know if that something about the lack of support of the R2P sheath was contributing to this. Maybe there was more drag or something. Maybe it wasn't tracking along the wires as easily. I don't know quite what what uh, you know led to this extensive level of dissection. I don't think the patient had an underlying arterial no. apathy that we know of. Mm -mm. Um, but Prakash, this was uh, this case was last week. It just took <laughs> life, uh, to, to do this case. Yeah. <laughs> So, Ravi, I mean, any tips you do? No, the only thing I think of is uh, I'm, I have not used a sheath, but it's the junction between the dilator and the sheath. I think that makes all the difference as you're making the curve. I know the the shuttles, so the cook you in general, yeah. have really, really good transitions. Uh, I think that's what Raman thought too. That the, the destination that there was a ledge. So I don't know about this one. So, if there's any ledge and you have that sharp takeoff, that may be where something occurred. It, it has it has a, a pretty reasonable transition, but it's not as as nice as these. It's not a, not a yeah. shuttle um, level. Yeah. The other thing which we were talking about is you know it's when you see these these cases and you see the anatomy you have to kind of deal with up front, albeit that your plan may be up front to say you're going to buy a transradial approach, just say hey let's make life easy. You know you see that yeah. anatomy just stop get the thermal <clears throat> axis and just try it. Well, you know, I, I think the other thing also is, you know, we do combine carotid standing. So, you know, it was a decision together to do it. And maybe in hindsight, maybe a T-car might have been a better approach here, you know, if, knowing that that was that ridge. I mean, we do a lot together. So I, uh, we honestly didn't anticipate this. What really bothered me was that the, the sheet dissection occurred so subtly, um, you know, and uh, I don't think we had any resistance or anything as we went through. And when it happened, we were kind of stuck. And then we were in this awkward position trying to stent the, the, the ostium of the common um, with, with the 014 wire up. And it was very, very difficult. Yeah, yeah. You know, so I think, I think that's what caused the prolapse of everything down because we, we wanted to hit the ostium. And, and then once it prolapsed, it just created a mess. And then injecting through the opposite side, we picked up a plaque and that was the end. Yeah. Well, the fact that the dissection went all the way back meant it started right at the origin of the common carotid artery, which really then supports the theory that it occurred at, at the time. As of you went up, process. right? Yeah. Exactly. That's true. That's right. That's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. Uh, I have a question just for the panel. Like, if you have dice, I know we didn't stand the innominate, right? Okay. So, uh, do you leave the patient on heparin drip for 24 hours? Because it's, there's a dissected innominate, and I know we are still watching it. Would you keep them on heparin drip? or We didn't. Well, we, we left the dissection. Well, we tacked up the disc ledge of the dissection. Right. So, yeah, so theoretically, there was flow in the anomaly, so we left it. We did talk about it, Peter and I, but with a patient with, uh, you know, carotid, a fresh carotid stent and all this stuff going on, she was totally asymptomatic. We put her on, uh, you know, we, we had loaded her with Plavix because we had already decided prior to, so she had Plavix prior to getting on the table, so she was fully, uh, you know, an, an under platelet inhibition. As a large vessel, high flow area, I think that the risk of thrombosis so. is probably low. But I mean, the good thing was just the follow-up was really good. But anyway, I wanted to share that case with you guys. It was not a fun case for us.